Hail, adventurer. I'm Myotis, and I have a Pact of the Blade Fiend Warlock build for you. I think Warlocks are one of the most underrated classes in the game. Typically, people like to do a small multi-class dip into Warlock, either two levels for Agonizing Blast and Eldritch Blast, or three levels for Pact of the Blade. And on most difficulties, the extra attack from Pact of the Blade actually stacks with the extra attack from Martial Classes. That's changed on Honor Mode, so I think there's actually a lot of value to go further into Warlock instead of just sticking with Paladin with some Sorcerer levels. They fill two different roles. Paladins are a lot better at Nova damage, throwing all of their resources out on a boss or a few larger enemies, but Warlocks are a lot more versatile. Being a slightly weird full caster that still gets access to extra attack gives them a lot of different combat options, and being a charisma caster makes them an excellent party face. I think that people also don't quite understand how to play a Warlock. The limited high-level spell slots makes it so that they want to cast a few high-impact spells, but they have one of the most consistent round-over-round -round damage options. Since all of their resources come back on short rests, they can basically go all day. Warlocks have surprisingly good tanking features, great damage, are excellent party faces and skill monkeys, they have unique battlefield control spells, and are capable of doing both good single target damage and AoE damage. Since all of their resources come back on short rest, they're basically at full power during the entire adventuring day. You typically want to start a combat with a big, impactful concentration spell, and then spend the following turns either Eldritch Blasting or making attacks with your packed weapon. So let's get into building this full 12 level Warlock, and we'll talk about multi-classing options towards the end as well, as well as item usage and how to build them into a party composition. We'll start with Race, and I think Will is an obvious choice as an origin character for Fiend Warlock since that's what he is at default, and actually getting to interact with your Warlock patron is such a huge boon to storytelling. You obviously don't have to play as Will, but I actually regret not choosing Will for my first full Warlock playthrough. In terms of Tav and Dark Urge race selection, it doesn't really matter what you choose, this is mostly a role-playing choice, but some of the best options are Human for the shield proficiency, either Wood Elf or Half Wood Elf for the extra movement speed, Dark Vision, and proficiency in Perception. Similarly, Drow give you proficiency in Perception as well as a Casting of Darkness, which will come into the build a little bit later, and Asmodeus Tiefling also gives you a Casting of Darkness and Hellish Rebuke, as well as Resistance to Fire damage, which is a super common damage type. Gith make for excellent spell swords, both because they get access to medium armor and a casting of Misty Step. Misty Step is really important for any kind of melee spell casting build, and unlike others, a warlock doesn't really want to spend their limited spell slots on a casting of Misty Step. Halfling is another great option. Their lucky feature letting them reroll ones is maybe one of the most powerful abilities in the game. But really, you can pick anything. I'm going to pick a tiefling because I think it's most thematic for a fiend warlock. I'm going to pick an Asmodeus tiefling for their casting of Darkness and Hellish Rebuke, but a Zariel tiefling for their smite casting is actually a really fitting choice for a Pact of the Blade user. For cantrips, we obviously want Eldritch Blast. Even though we're going to be focusing on melee weapon attacks, it's still a great thing to have in your tool belt. For our second choice here, you can either take Blade Ward. Casting it before combat starts can help you survive those first few early turns, especially in the beginning of the game when you don't have as many hit points as some of your martial melee counterparts. Otherwise, you can pick up Friends, which can help you get through certain dialogue checks, but you have to be careful on higher difficulties because it can get you into some trouble. Minor Illusion and Mage Hand can also be good utility spells, but since Warlock makes such a great party face, I do think Friends is the right choice here. For subclass, we are going to choose Fiend for Dark One's Blessing. This gives us scaling temporary hit points on kills based on our Warlock level. Since we're taking all Warlock levels, this is going to be a huge amount of hit points towards the end of the game. Now for our first level spells, there are a ton of good options here. Normally, I think you would take Armor of Agathis. This is a great spell that scales really well with Warlock spell slots. The five temporary hit points and damage when you get hit really adds up, but I think this is actually not as good on a Fiend Warlock because we're already getting temporary hit points from our passive, so this just opens us up for other options. Arms of Hadar is kind of neat, but the damage is so low that it's very rarely going to outscale your Eldritch Blast or your melee attacks. I actually like to pick up Burning Hands, mostly because it's specific to the Fiend Warlock, but having some kind of area of effect damage can be really useful when you find yourself up against a lot of enemies. Command is another great spell. This is a great one turn crowd control spell, and you can use it to make an enemy flee or move closer into an active area of effect. But I think one of the go-to choices early is Hex. We can potentially maintain concentration on it all day, and the 1d6 necrotic damage is a great early boost. When you cast it, you give the enemy disadvantage on an ability of your choice, but this is specifically for ability checks. People often think that it affects saving throws, but that is not the case. So typically your best bet is to choose strength, so it's easier to push enemies. Now for background, 
background, much like race, it's kind of up to you based on the backstory you have in your head of your character. Guild Artisan is an often go-to choice because Insight and Persuasion are good ability checks, but we actually have an alternate way to get Persuasion. So I'd take Urchin for Sleight of Hand if you want this character to be a lock picker, or Sage if you want to fill out some Intelligence checks. Arcana and History don't come up a ton, but they're kind of nice to have when they do. Now for our ability spread. Obviously the default is Trash, so we're just going to clear it out. I think we do want to keep the plus two in Charisma and plus one in Dexterity. Pact of the Blade is going to let us use our Charisma modifier on our weapon attacks, so we don't need Strength. We want our Dex to sit around 16. This will give us a plus three to AC, as well as a plus three initiative bonus, which is really important. Being one of the first characters to act in combat can make a world of difference. You also want this if you decided to go Urchin as your background. Now since we're going to be a melee character, we do want some Constitution. It also helps with our Constitution saving throws on maintaining concentration on spells. And we're almost always going to be concentrating on something, so I'd bring this up to 14. You can also dump Intelligence, since it doesn't really affect anything aside from a few skill checks. We also don't need Wisdom, but it's nice to have a little bit, since it's such a common saving throw. Finally, we want to max out our Charisma. This affects all of our spell difficulty checks, our melee attack rules with Pact of the Blade, Eldritch Blast's chance to hit and its damage, and our most important skill checks. I would take 17 Charisma here, with the intention of eating a certain piece of hair, but you could also take 16, then put the final two points either into Strike strength for a slightly better jump, a 10 in intelligence so you don't have a negative 1 to ability checks, or you could bump wisdom up to 12. I'm going to leave mine at 17. You could also switch dexterity and constitution if you're a little bit more worried about your health and your concentration checks. But since we have Dark One's Blessing for the extra temp HP, I don't actually think we need the health. Finally, we have two skill proficiencies to choose. I would keep Intimidation, but I actually have intentions on taking Deception a different way, so I'm going to take Investigation instead. If you went with an Urchin background for Sleight of Hand and Stealth, I could maybe see taking Arcana instead. Now let's jump into the rest of the levels. Now at level 2 we get a new spell. I'd probably pick up Command if you didn't at level 1, otherwise you could take Burning Hands if you didn't. I don't think Hellish Rebuke is something we ever really want to spend a spell slot on. Witch Bolt is only really good for very specific lightning themed builds. You could have Armor of Agathis in your pocket. It is kind of nice to have if your party needs a short rest, but you have leftover spell slots to use up, and you don't already have temporary hit points active from Dark One's Blessing. But more importantly, we get Eldritch Invocations here. These are some of our most important abilities. I think it's always right to start with Agonizing Blast, which adds our Charisma modifier to Eldritch Blast. We're going to have Pact of the Blade next level, but there's nothing wrong with having an excellent melee and ranged ability. For your second Eldritch Invocation, you have a few different choices. You could take Armor of Shadows for free mage armor casting. If you're pretty confident, you're going to be using clothing, but you could also have another party member cast it on you. Repelling Blast is great alongside Agonizing Blast, but I don't think it's as necessary for this build. Since we want to get into melee range, you don't really want to be pushing enemies away from you. You really only want this for pushing enemies off ledges or into other spell effects. So I think we will take this eventually, but not at this level. Devil Sight is another go-to invocation. I do think we want it eventually. Being able to see in Magical Darkness is really powerful, and as an Osmodius Tiefling, we will have access to a Casting of Darkness, but I'd only really take it at this level if you know you're going to lean into a Darkness build. What I actually like to take is Beguiling Influence. This will give us proficiency in Deception and Persuasion that we didn't pick up at level 1. So we have a nice suite of different ability checks, and especially as a main character, this makes us great at dialogue. You could just pick these up at level 1 and pick a different invocation, but I really like skill checks. Maybe that's just tabletop bias. Finally, you can replace a spell. This is a feature we're going to use more than I think other classes do. Since all our spell slots share a level, it makes a lot of sense to replace old, lower level spells with the new ones that we come across. You get new spell levels every other level, so you can also use these in-between even levels to swap some spells around and experiment with different things. If you find that you're not casting Hex, maybe, you could swap it out for Armor of Agathis and try it. Or maybe you find your character surrounded a lot and Harms of Hadar could actually be a lot of good at these early levels. And then you could replace it later on. But I actually like these early picks, so I'm not going to replace anything just yet. On to level 3. So we get our first second level spell here. There are a lot of great options at level 2. You could take Darkness if you took Devil's Sight. Blindness is a great spell in this game, especially against spellcasters. Hold Person and Crowd of Madness are both excellent crowd control spells. And Cloud of Daggers is another great damaging spell, especially potent if you took Repelling Blast to push enemies into it after they walk out. But I actually like picking up Misty Step. We're going to try and avoid casting it with our Warlock spell slots, but it's nice to have when you really need it. Then we get our Pact Boon, and we're of course sticking Pact of the Blade. This will let us bind any melee weapon into our our packed weapon, 
so that it uses charisma for its attack and damage rolls. This also means that it doesn't matter what we have proficient in, as long as a weapon is bound, we have proficiency with it. As of patch 6, I believe you also can't be disarmed, and the binding will actually persist over long rests, but you do actually have to be careful because a bound weapon can't be equipped to another party member, so you do have to unbind it. This gives us a huge array of build options, but we'll talk more about that towards the end of the video. As an Osmodeus Tiefling, we get access to one casting of Hellish Rebuke per long rest. This is a nice ability to have as a melee character, and it's upcasted to level 2, and not something we'd actually want to spend our limited Warlock spell slots on. Then we can replace the spell. Since we get new spell levels here, I think it makes sense to replace Burning Hands. I always like to upgrade to the newest fire spell from the Fiend Warlock's expanded spell list. And level 4. We get an extra cantrip at level 4. I actually do like picking up Bone Chill. It's pretty rare that we're going to use it over Eldritch Blast, but Bone Chill prevents enemies from healing. There's a few enemies, and especially a boss in Act 2, where this is really important. You want it somewhere on your team. If you have a wizard or someone with it, you don't really need to put it on your warlock. Otherwise, you might take Blade Ward or Minor Illusion. Maybe even Mage Hand, if you don't already have someone else with it or with Fine Familiar. I'm going to shake Bone Chill here just because I kind of like it. Another level 2 spell. I'd probably take Darkness or Hold Person. Both of these are great control spells to have access to. You can replace a spell if you want to, but I don't think I need to right now. And we have a few options for our feet. The most obvious choice is Ability Score Improvement, bumping up Charisma as much as we can. With the right choices in Act 1, this could give you a nice even 20. Warlocks are also a great candidate for the actor feat. This gives you expertise in deception and performance, even if you don't already have skill proficiency in them. I wouldn't take this and Beguiling Influence, I would pick one or the other. So since I picked Beguiling Influence, I think I won't take this. If you're having a hard time maintaining concentration, you could pick a Warcaster this early, but I don't think it's that important for this character. Alert is a great feat for anyone, especially on Honor Mode. And if you're finding yourself a little bit too squishy, you can actually take a Moderately Armored. It's one of the few classes where this is actually a good choice. If you're planning on taking this, I definitely have an odd number to dexterity score, so you can bump this up for a plus one, but this gives you access to medium armor and shields. Eventually we'll want two-handed weapons, but early in the game, most of our best choices are one-handed, and until our Dark One's Blessing is giving us a lot more hit points, having the higher AC is definitely good. But if you got one of these from your race, then obviously you don't need it. I actually did take this in my Warlock playthrough. It really helped with the early levels, but I would respec out of it later. So if you're not doing respecs, I probably wouldn't take this. Really, I think just the the best thing is taking the ASI into Charisma, and then we can move on to level 5. Now we have access to level 3 spells. Warlocks have a couple of really, really good choices. I think you have to take Counterspell. Even if you have another character in your party that can take Counterspell, stopping a deadly spell in its tracks is just way too powerful to ignore. The wrong spell hitting your team could absolutely end an encounter, and in some cases an entire honor mode run. We get a new Eldritch Invocation here. At this point, you just want to take Repelling Blast or Devil's Sight, whichever you haven't already picked up. And in my case, since I have neither, it really depends. I'd take Devil's Sight, but if you're already a character with Dark Vision, I think Repelling Blast is a great choice here. As an Asmodeus Tiefling, we get Darkness now, and then we can replace a spell. And on these levels where we get new spell slot levels, I always would. And I think we want to take what is probably the best level 3 Warlock spell, so I'm going to replace one of these concentration spells like Hex at this point for Hunger of Hadar. This spell has a huge area of effect, does some okay damage, blinds the enemies inside, but lets you cast an attack into it without a problem. You can also use Eldritch Blast with Repelling Blast to push enemies back into it if you need to. It's almost always right to start off an encounter like this unless you're against a boss that doesn't have a lot of enemies around it. It doesn't seem to be showing us this anywhere, but here we get a deepened path. So now we have extra attack with our packed weapon. So at this point, around level 5, you should have a half decent magic weapon that you can bind as your packed weapon, and it's going to outscale Eldritch Blast damage. So you want to be trying to get into melee range, but you don't have to rush into it like some other characters would. You can spend that first turn setting up and let enemies start to approach you. Then we can move on to level 6. We get Dark One's own luck at level 6. This lets us add a d10 to any ability check once per short rest. This is actually a huge bonus. You can try to save it for really important persuasion checks, but you do want to try to use it between every short rest. This gives us a huge amount of versatility that few other characters get. Bards can help other people's checks, but it's a little bit more difficult for them to help their own outside of the expertise. This is where the versatility of the Warlock comes in. We have some great damage options, we're great at skill checks, we're growing in levels so our Dark One's Blessing bonus is increasing, and we just keep getting new fun spells. I definitely pick up Fireball here at level 6. This is one of the best area of effect damage spells in the game, and just continues to give us a ton of good options. You could replace a spell here too if you really like something else. Scorching Ray is a fine replacement after picking up Fireball. You could grab Fly or Fear for more CC. Darkness if you're finding your team is building towards it. You can even pick up Armor of Agathis now to at least start your day with some temporary hit points, and then rely on Dark One's Blessing as the day progresses. Or we might be running into more spellcasters here, so we can actually take Blindness since it doesn't require concentration. We're going to be starting a lot of fights with Hunger of Hadar, so having some other non-concentration CC can be really helpful. Otherwise, you could pick Hex back up, because I think it's pretty good against bosses. Now we're level 7. 
We've got level four spell slots at this level. And the most important thing for us to pick up is Wall of Fire. I think this is low key one of the best spells in the game. It's great for laying on top of an immobile boss, so they just take damage turn after turn. And the enemy AI seems to have a hard time navigating it, so they're often just run straight into it. A well-placed Wall of Fire can just end encounters. It's a nice mix up for starting combat with Hunger of Hadar. We got another Eldritch Invocation here, so I'm gonna take Devil's Sight. At this point, you wanna make sure you have Agonizing Blast, Devil Sight, and Repelling Blast. If you have all three of those and need to pick a fourth, none of these are particularly outstanding. I think Book of Ancient Secrets is quite bad. It's pretty rare that any of these spells are going to be better than Eldritch Blast. And these invocations that give you a casting of a spell using a Warlock spell slot are also pretty bad. You could pick up Armor of Shadows here if you're using clothing still. Beast Speech is okay if you don't have access to it, but it's so easy to get potions for it. Fiendish Vigor is also pretty bad, but if you didn't pick up Armor of Agathis, you can at least start your day off with some temporary hit points. Mask of Many Faces Disguise Self can actually be really useful, but I think it's more useful in tabletop than it is in this game. But if you have an item you want to use that uses a specific race type, this can be useful. One with shadows to become invisible is like, okay. The problem is that you have to stand still in it, so it doesn't work like normal invisibility. If Confusion ever works properly, you could take Dreadful Word. But half the time casting this spell, it seems to just do nothing. Unfortunately, our most important invocation doesn't come until level 12. But that's kind of why I like taking Beguiling Influence early. So now I have access to all the most important invocations. Of course, it's always wise to replace a spell once you get new spell slot levels. It might make sense to replace like Hold Person with Banishment. It's kind of just an upgrade. It takes a much weirder saving throw to save against this than Hold Person does. Blight isn't particularly great damage and it's pretty easy for enemies to succeed on the saving throw. Dimension Door is kind of a nice to have, although since it takes an action, I wouldn't just replace Misty Step with it. And since we're a melee character, taking Fire Shield can actually be kind of useful, but I might pick it up at level eight. Speaking of level eight, for our spells, like I said, I think I'll take Fire Shield. We can replace a spell here as well. I don't think there's anything here I particularly want, but if you find you're not using one of your spells and want to try something else, this is a great opportunity to do it. Otherwise, we get our second feat. If you didn't max your Charisma, you definitely want to do this at this level. And eventually I'm going to suggest Great Weapon Master, but I think we can hold off on it for now. That kind of makes Warcaster our best pick, since we're often maintaining concentration on either Hunger of Hadar, Hex, or Wall of Fire. Advantage on those rolls is really useful. Depending on your stat spread, you could also take Resilient Constitution instead. This raises your constitution by one, so you want to make sure you have an odd number. You can always respect to make sure that all works out, but I think I'm going to take Warcaster. At level 9, we finally have 5th level spell slots. We have 3 level 5 spells to choose from, and I think we want all 3 of them. I'm going to start with Cone of Cold, because it helps diversify our damage. We also get another Eldritch Invocation. Minions of Chaos is okay here. Summons are always good to have around, but it's important to note that this does use a spell slot. Otherworldly Leap is also okay, especially since we have a bad jump with our low strength score. But at level 9, you probably found a way around this already, but if you don't like any of the other options, you can definitely pick it up. I think the Minions of Chaos are a little bit more useful to us, but it's really your own choice. I'll also probably upgrade Fireball to Flame Strike. This does 10d6 damage, but half of it is radiant. So it could help get around the fact that Fireball is fully fire damage, which is the most resisted in the game, other than maybe poison. We can head to level 10. We get Fiendish Resilience at this level, which lets you pick any damage type to become resistant to indefinitely. And then you can change that resistance once per short rest. This is a huge defensive buff. If you have even a little bit of an idea of what damage types certain encounters are going to be using the most of, this easily doubles your health pool. I think Piercing is probably one of the best go-tos, so that you're resistant to bows and crossbows, as well as a lot of weapon types. But you might want Fire Resistance for some fiends, Necrotic against certain undead. I think this ability is really glossed over since most people are multi-classing a few levels into Warlock and never getting deep enough to see this ability even, but it's actually wildly good. It also doesn't take action economy to change up the resistance type, so if you find yourself in danger of something, you can swap it up. Get another cantrip here. I'll probably pick up Blade Ward, although if you have it already, this is where maybe I'd take up Bone Chill, but past Act 2, I don't think that's as important. So you could take Minor Illusion or True Strike just to flex. Get a last level 5 spell slot here with Hold Monster, which is just a solid CC spell for anything in the game, basically. And you can replace something if you want to, but I don't really think we need to. At level 11, we get a lot of different stuff. Also worth noting at level 10 our Eldritch Blast went up to 3 blasts, but you probably have a good enough magic weapon that if you're not specifically building into Eldritch Blast, your weapon should still outscale the 3 Eldritch Blasts. 
we get Mystic Arcanum here. So this gives us one level six spell that we can cast once per long rest. I really wish this was once per short rest. That would be very warlocky, but maybe that's too good. Sadly, not all of these are particularly great. Circle of Death is okay, but the damage is slow and the AoE is so huge that it's almost impossible not to hit allies with it. Arcane Gate can be okay, but I never found myself wishing I had it in any of my playthroughs so far. Eye Bite is often an okay spell, but it takes your action to continue to reapply on enemies. And we really want to be using our actions to make melee weapon attacks. Flesh to Stone is an interesting one. The problem is it takes so many saving throws to go into effect that you're probably just killing the enemy by then anyway. I think the only option that really makes sense is Create Undead. You just get a free mummy every day. Then especially if you took a Conjure Elemental earlier, we can start amassing a small army. We also get our third Warlock spell slot at this level. This gives us nine level five spell slots a day. This makes all our spell casting so potent. We also get extremely boosted by a Bard. If we have a third short rest, now we're getting 12 level five spell slots. Now honestly, have a hard time using them all. Now for spells, we have to pick stuff level five or lower. So you could pick up something that you got rid of before, maybe you could use now. Maybe I'd really like to try Crown of Madness. Dimension Door can be really helpful in some of the Act 3 encounters. And Fear is a pretty solid CC spell. If you want some situational AC that doesn't require concentration, you could also pick up Mirror Image. It's kind of dealer's choice at this point. Even Hellish Rebuke this late, upgraded to a level 5 spell slot, can help you finish off enemies. These last few spell choices are really kind of dealer's choice. It's whatever you want to play around with. Kind of like Hellish Rebuke. Probably not going to replace anything at this point. Now we're level 12. This is our crowning jewel. So we can take a spell, or maybe take Mirror Image at this point, then we get our last Eldritch Invocation. So we're absolutely taking Life Drinker. This adds our Charisma modifier a second time to our melee attack damage. We're going to at least have a plus five to our Charisma. You do have to watch that it's necrotic damage and some things will have resistance to that, but flat damage bonuses are almost always better on average than rolled damage bonuses. And this takes no resources. This is the ability that we're going 12 levels into Warlock 4. Kills are now also granting us nearly 20 temporary hit points from Dark One's Blessing, we're reaching a point where we're almost unkillable. You can replace a spell a final time if you want to, but then we also get a feat, and at this point we should have a really solid two-handed weapon, so we're going to take Great Weapon Master. A lot of builds want to take this much earlier on in leveling, but the Warlock doesn't have a super solid way to either give themselves advantage or add a bonus to hit, so we're better to take this in these later levels when we've itemized up enough that we can offset the minus five to attack rolls more easily. This gives us another plus ten to damage rolls, and since we're going to be fishing for kills for our Dark One's Blessing bonus, we're also going to make great use of the bonus action attack on kills from Great Weapon Master. So this level 12 spike is huge. We're getting an extra 15 damage per melee attack and potentially making a third attack many rounds. On top of already being a great spellcaster, we're extremely tanky, we're great at ability checks, we really just do it all. Let's talk briefly about some alternate options before we go into itemization. You could stop at level 10 Warlock and take two levels of Paladin. You'd have two level 5 spell slots every short rest, so you could have some pretty massive Divine Smites a few times a day, but that gives up our round over round damage with Life Drinker, and you'd have to take Great Weapon Master a little earlier. So you trade out consistency for Nova damage, which is often better in Dungeons and Dragons, but you can have other members in your party for that and have the Warlock fill a much more universal role. If you really want to lean into the melee combat, you could take three levels of Battle Master for a few maneuvers and a fighting style, or five levels of Swords Bard for weapon flourishes that come back on short rests alongside your Warlock spell slots. Swords Bard would also give you expertise, so it helps improve your out of combat utility. You can get the stacking extra attacks from Pact of the Weapon, an extra attack from any of these classes or others, but I think the pure Warlock has even more value in Honor Mode. Now you have a lot of item versatility with this character. I like Vision of the Absolute as an early game weapon pickup. Potentially blinding enemies is a great additional way to debuff them. You can also still hold a shield with this weapon, if you get it from your race or a feat. Follower Luve is a great pick as well. You're going to be in the thick of things, so pre-casting the melody either on Shriek or Sing is a great additional way to boost your allies. This character is also a great candidate for the Blood of the Thander. The light it produces is pretty important in Act 2, but I actually really like the Baneful on this character. Baning enemies on a hit is a really powerful effect, and since this weapon only works as a bound or packed weapon, there are a few other characters that can actually make use of it like you can. Shattered Flail is also a great option, but again, you can literally pick any melee weapon, so whatever is left over from your companions is an absolutely fine choice. Since we're making weapon attacks, Caustic Band is also a good choice, but it might be better suited to a pure martial character. If you find you're starting out a lot of combats with a casting or two of Eldritch Blast, then the Ring of Arcane Synergy giving you extra charisma damage on your melee attacks after that can actually be a really powerful effect. I really like the Amulet of Misty Step on this character. For basically the whole game, you don't really want to use your Warlock spell slots on Misty Step unless you really have to, so having one free cast per short rest can help save those spell slots for more impactful spells. 
The Warped Headband of Intellect is also a great early pickup, so it really helps improve some otherwise bad ability checks because of our low intelligence score. Alternatively, you can eventually pick up the Diadem of Arcane Synergy. Inflicting a condition with the Baneful makes it really easy to gain Arcane Synergy from this item. Bracers of Defense can be really useful if none of your other characters can use it, since you might be using clothing in the early game instead of armor. Otherwise, the Gloves of Dexterity serve a similar purpose, bumping your dexterity to 18 for better AC and initiative. You can get the Boots of Striding relatively early in Act 1. Since concentrating on spells like Hex is important to you, this helps you move around the combat and avoid going prone when you otherwise would, ending your concentration early. But you'll probably replace them with the Disintegrating Nightwalkers once you get them. These are some of the best boots of the game, and you'll probably use them until late into Act 3. Similar to the Necklace, the Once Per Short Rest Misty Step is really useful. If you're using shields, the Adamantine Shield is probably the best shield in Act 1. Otherwise, you could be dual wielding light weapons for an extra attack with your bonus action. Although it won't be as good as your main packed weapon attacks. In Act 2, you can pick up the Helmet of Arcane Acuity. I think there are other characters that use this better than the Warlock can, but depending on how you pick your spells, combining this with the Ring of the Mystic Scoundrel in Act 3 can be really useful, but it's probably at its strongest on a Swords Bard. Since we're always concentrating, the Strange Conduit Ring is a great thing to pick up, and your best in slot armors in Act 2 are either the Potent Robes, although we're not focusing on our Eldritch Blasts, or the Yuntai Scale Mail, if you have medium armor proficiency. Otherwise, just the best light armor you can find. You can also pick up the Cloak of Protection for extra AC to protect your temporary hit points from Dark One's Blessing. In Act 3, some of our best helmets are the Helm of Baldoran, if you have the proficiency for it. Otherwise, Birthright to boost our charisma is really good here. With the Mirror of Loss, we can actually get to 24 charisma, which means between the Pact of the Weapon and Life Drinker, we're adding 14 damage through our charisma to our attacks. This character is an also a great candidate for the entire Helldusk armor set, although we don't need the immunity to Blinded so much because because of Devil's Sight, but Helldusk armor doesn't require proficiency, so we can wear all of these pieces. Helldusk boots are kind of just an upgrade to the Disintegrating Nightwalkers. The gloves give us extra fire damage and plus one to our spell attack rolls and spell save DC, so it really boosts everything that we do. Being able to cast Fly as a bonus action helps improve our mobility along with all our castings of Misty Step and Hellcrawler. I like the Cloak of Displacement in Act 3 as well for this character, but cloaks are pretty versatile so you can kind of use whatever one you like the best. If you don't feel like you need the Misty Step from the amulet, you can switch to the Fae Semblance amulet so that you're much tankier against spell casting. You can use the Crypt Lord's Ring for extra Create Undeads if you need to. You're not super reliant on any ring slots, so you can kind of pick whatever your companions don't need. I like having Gaunter Mail in our range slot for the casting of Haste. And for our Act 3 weapons, since we don't use Strength, we can't really use the Giant Slayer, but Duke Ravenguard's Longsword is actually one of our best in slot choices. Giving our allies temporary hit points as well as ourselves based off our Charisma modifier is really excellent. There are a few characters other than maybe some bards that could use this as well as us. It also gives us a nice little plus two to our Charisma, although it doesn't stack a above 20, although it doesn't say it there. This is pretty hard to obtain though, and I haven't tested it on patch 6. If you're dual wielding, Rhapsody is also a great choice. Again, we're going for kills, so getting the plus 3 to our attack rolls, damage, and spell save DC is pretty easy. But I think one of our best choices is actually the Sword of Chaos. The healing combined with the temporary hit points from Dark One's Blessing makes us literally unkillable. You can go toe to toe with some of the hardest enemies in the game, and very easily mitigate the damage they deal to you, especially with the parry up to wound closure. But again, the choice is kind of yours, and if one of your other characters could make better use of any of these weapons, then you can slot in almost anything else. It would also be possible to build this character around radiating orbs, reverberation, mental fatigue, or if you're a gith, you could make use of all the gith-specific equipment. A few other notable items might be the elven chain and elegant studded leather as your best in slot main armor equipment outside of the Helldusk armor, amulet of greater health, which would give you a huge con boost, and mean that you don't need to take Warcaster. The Infernal Rapier is a great option for extra summons, and a second weapon that uses your Charisma modifier without having to be a packed weapon, and the Infernal Robes from Act 1. Finally, let's talk about some team options. The versatility of this character means you can fit it into almost any party, but I think specifically, this kind of warlock wants a second frontline fighter to go along with them to help draw some of the aggro off them, especially early game that won't have as much HP, and it can be hard to get a ton of AC until late game, especially something like a Battlemaster that can knock enemies prone, giving the Pact of the Blade Warlock extra hit chance. Bards are also excellent in a party with Warlocks, since the extra short rest refreshes all of their abilities outside of Mystic Arcanum. You probably want somebody else that has expertise in Sleight of Hand as well, as a stronger Lockpicker and Trap Disarmor. This character can do it, but not as well as a Rogue or a Bard. They're great in a Darkness build because of Devil Sight. They can wear almost any equipment. You get Cone of Cold for wet builds. They can make use of Ring of the Mystic Scoundrel with Hold Person, Hold Monster, Command, and Banishment. It's just overall a really fun and thematic class. If you liked this build, be sure to like the video and subscribe for more. This is the first of many planned Baldur's Gate videos, so stay tuned. Of course, if you disliked it, make sure you unsubscribe and leave a hateful comment. Rather than focus on overpowered builds like the Throw Zerker and Gloomstalker Assassin, I prefer thematic synergy.
synergistic builds that are still viable and help make each run through the game feel fresh. Until the next time, happy adventuring.